just by accident, I wrote a letter to Brian Epstein uh, asking him to interview them in Jacksonville, Florida, which was their closest stop to Miami, one single interview. I got a letter back uh, interviewing me for the entire, uh, inter asking me to go on the entire tour for the sum of $3,000, which would cover 35 days of travel in 25 cities. And uh, I told my bosses, I don't want to go. There were too many big stories happening that year in America. And why would I, as you saw in the film, a newsman want to uh, travel with a band, a band that would be here in uh, September and gone by December? So, so obviously, you know, I now tell journalism students, never, ever turn down a story, ever. Well, that's good advice. What was it like to be in the inner sanctum of the biggest pop group in the world? Well, first of all, I didn't know they were going to be the biggest pop group in the world. If I had known, I would have purchased a nice camera instead of the little junky Kodak Instamatic that I brought along. Uh, nobody knows when you're in the middle of history, but about a week and a half into it, I started to realize that, as I said in Ron Howard's amazing film, that I was witnessing a cultural generational shift that may never happen again. To be with them was extraordinary. They, were, uh, they had tremendous panache on stage and privately. They were four very substantial people. Uh, John was uh, the most interesting, of course, because he said in public what a lot of people think in private. Uh, Paul was a guy who never met an audience he didn't love or like. Uh, George Harrison was not necessarily the quiet Beatle. He had a lot to say. One day we were coming down with an, uh, for an emergency landing in Portland, Oregon, and as the plane was uh, coming down, he said, Now, Larry, I just want to tell you, if anything should happen to this airplane, it's Beatles and children first. So he was, he had a great sense of humor. And Ringo, surprisingly to a lot of people, was one of the most intellectually curious people I've ever met. And Adrian, one of the reasons I got along with them so well is that I didn't ask them questions like the older 30 and 40 year olds who despise them uh, would ask them questions like, what do you eat for breakfast? What do you like in a woman? Do you like blondes, brunettes, redheads? Uh, did you wash your hair? Did you shower today? Uh, my questions were about what was happening, something that happened at a concert, something that was happening in, with racial tensions around the world, uh, things that were happening in terms of the escalation of the war in Vietnam, the aftermath of the assassination of the president. It was, um, you know, it was great talking to them, and they enjoyed it. And as you can tell from Ron's very, very, very special film, uh, they, they liked sort of putting me on and uh, treating me as a straight man to their humor. And the Beatles were touring while America was gripped with race issues and segregation, and the group seemed to help break down some of that segregation by being there. Well, it all started, uh, ironically, in a conversation I had with them in Las Vegas, Nevada. The station, my station in Miami, had advised me that the Gator Bowl concert, and Gator Bowl is a large football stadium, or was a large football stadium in Jacksonville, was going to be segregated. And the minute they found out to a man, they stood up in the room and they said, we're not going to go there. We're not going to do that. And Brian Epstein, their manager, just kept turning whiter and whiter, uh, not really understanding what, what was going to happen. And he, he began a negotiation on, I think it was about August 20th, 1964. And by September 11th, they had secured the fact that the place would be integrated for the first time ever, which changed things throughout the South. Now, it is fascinating that the production team and Howard were, was, were able to find a girl, a woman who's a teenage girl at the time, who is black, who talks about sitting with white people for the first time. And what a liberating experience was to be together with white people and not separate, not to have to go into a a separate bathroom or a separate water fountain. And she eventually became an historian. And I thought that, I thought that part of the movie was a seminal moment in the Beatles' history. Another seminal moment seems to be when they played the very first ever stadium shows and just how insane that all appeared to be. Well, if you look at their faces at the uh, background film that Ron Howard and the production team of... Uh, the producers of Nigel Sinclair and Scott Pescucci put together, uh, you find that they were astounded. There were three arrivals at Shea Stadium. 
They came over and flew over by helicopter. They then landed at the World Fair exhibit area in Queens, New York, and they were brought in by a uh, Wells Fargo truck. Therefore, the, uh, the badges, six-star sheriff's badges they wore. And they couldn't believe it. Uh, I was interviewing them before it and after it. And they were just astounded that that one, many people would come to see him. And of course, that was the very first big concert in the history of, of uh, music. Another aspect of their history that's so interesting is the backlash the Beatles experienced in America and call-outs for people to burn their albums and memorabilia. What prompted all of that? Well, John Lennon was interviewed by a very famous reporter named Maureen Cleave. And in the, in the article, and I don't have the exact words with me now, but they're in my uh, first book, Ticket to Ride. In the, in the article, he talks about the fact that the Beatles, and he, he, he views it as a superficial part of life, that the Beatles got so big that they're bigger than religion in some places. And he did not say they were bigger than Christ. He said, some people believe we may be bigger than Christ. And uh, he, he thought that was absurd. As a result of that, he was misquoted in the American media, and DJs in the South started burnathons to take anything Beatles, uh, vinyl records, pictures, anything, and burn them. And it upset them tremendously and contributed to the poignant moment that you see uh, toward the end of uh, Ron Howard's uh, just magical journey with them, uh, that the decision they made to, uh, to stop touring. And uh, you see in 1966 how they changed from 1964 and 65. And you've described them as probably the greatest show business experience in history. We've, of course, seen other mania around supergroups like the Rolling Stones and ABBA and more recently, I guess, One Direction. But do you think we'll ever see anything that rivals that Beatle mania ever again? No, not in our lifetime, maybe not in a hundred lifetimes. Uh, the reason for that is that the Beatles were a universal shared experience. We all go through shared experiences in our lives. It might be war, it might be a, a snowstorm, it might be a, a religious holiday where everybody comes together. In, in Adelaide, Australia, uh, 500,000 people out of a million in the town showed up to see them. The same uh, w women in San Francisco as in Chicago or Minneapolis or Denver were staring at them. With, they, they were staring at them so dramatically, thinking that every one of them was singing to them. I would get letters from people later saying, uh, tell John I will meet him at the drugstore in this city at 5 o'clock on August 17th so we can really start the beginning of our destiny together. Uh, this was the kind of uh, effect they had on young people. And then, not only did they uh, bring this emotion out of, of young girls, then young adults started getting into it. And the music, it was a combination of the sex appeal, the passion, the music, the liberation of people to say what they felt. And by 1967 or 68, when they were coming out with some more great music, Sgt. Pepper and Robert Soul and Revolver. By those years, uh, those same people who were screaming at them in Shea Stadium were going to college or trade school, and some of them were protesting war. So basically, they, uh, they really grew up with their fans, and their fans grew up with them. And then about 1985, they became the iconic Beatles, and they have been ever since.